Shalom, this is Anayahu. Uh, I'm making this video because I would I would like you to tell me why you think the law of Moses should not be kept, is not necessary to keep anymore. Because um, I believe that all people of the earth, uh, Israelites and Gentiles, are supposed to keep the law of Moses. But I know most Christians think otherwise. And so before I make videos on the Law of Moses, I would like to uh, compile reasons why people think the Law of Moses is not done for, uh, is not for today. Um, you could you could send me a comment message about the Law of Moses not being for today. Um, that that works. That's fine. Or a private message, but it would also be great if you did a video response too. Because uh, if you did a video response, then you could go a little bit in more in depth as to why you believe the law of Moses is not for today. Um, I'm I'm really curious why people believe that. I, I know there are a lot of issues. Uh, a lot of things that they think the New Testament says is is uh, what what are their reasons, justifications for it, and um, for why they believe the law of Moses is not for today. So you can make a video response on that or comment uh, anything. Uh, I just I just want to know why you believe the law of Moses is not for today, if that's what you believe. And then once once I hopefully I get some responses. If I don't though, then um, then I'll just work with what I have and um, I'll do some research as well uh, for other people's opinions online and then basically what I will I will do is start my videos and show you why I believe the law of Moses should be kept okay so that that that's the end of this video this is probably my shortest video I've made in recent times <laughs> so uh, yeah just uh, I hope you respond, and uh, I'm looking forward to the reasons why you think a lot of Moses is not for today. Thank you, and Shalom. Shalom, this is Anayahu. In this video, I would like to demonstrate my interpretation of Acts chapter 15, the Council of Jerusalem, and how I believe that it reconciles with my belief that the law of Moses needs to be kept by both Gentiles and Israelites. So all people need to keep the law of Moses, and that the law of Moses was not abolished. So now let me explain why I believe that. Um, first of all, uh, if you look at scripture and if you look at history, you see well, there are multiple kinds of circumcision. There is circumcision that was given to Abraham and also to Moses. This is called circumcision of the flesh, okay? There's also something called circumcision of the heart. Those are two very different things, but they're both referred to as circumcision. Uh, now, there's a third kind of circumcision that you're probably not aware of. It's, uh, it's practiced by rabbis today, the Orthodox Jews today. It's called Hatzafa Dambrit. I will spell it for you. H A T A F A T, and D A M, and then B R I T. Um, now, basically, I, I'll read it right here from Wikipedia. What it is, okay? Uh, circumcision alone, in the absence of the Brit Mila ceremony, according to the Orthodox Jews, that is, does not fulfill the requirements of the mitzvah to be circumcised. In the case of a Jew who was circumcised outside of a Brit Milah or an already circumcised convert, the Mohel draws a symbolic drop of blood from the penis. Okay, so that is the Orthodox Jews requiring further things for someone who's already circumcised. That's a circumcision that is contrary to Torah. That's not Torah says. It says you have to be circumcised. It does not say if you are already circumcised you have to do this and this and this. No. That's a completely 
foreign thing, but the Orthodox Jews teach this, and I contend that that's what, that's the circumcision that Paul and all the people were speaking against in the early days of the believers of the Messiah. There's also this idea, did you know that people could, they could uncircumcise themselves by reconstructing, reconstructing the foreskin. So I imagine that some Pharisees were teaching that you had to uncircumcise yourself by reconstructing the foreskin and then re-circumcise yourself so that you would be doing it the proper way. Now this is completely contrary to scripture, contrary to Torah. And so this is the kind of circumcision that Paul and the early believers were speaking against. So in, when, with, with that, the people in Acts chapter 15 who were talking about circumcision, they were speaking against, I mean, they, they were, the people in Acts 15 who were saying the Gentiles had to be circumcised, it was not the, the circumcision of the law of Moses, it was their circumcision, the circumcision that they were claiming they had to do. But that's not biblical. Their kind of circumcision is very contrary. All right. So now, with that in mind, let's read from Acts chapter 15. Uh, we're going to read from Acts chapter 15, New King James Version. All right. All right, so let's start. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. That was verse 1. Again, I believe that it's very clear that the, the circumcision they're talking about is, uh, it's their circumcision. They, they're claiming it's according to the custom of Moses, but it's not. It's not according to the custom of Moses. Throughout scripture, we see that people added laws to Moses and called it Moses' law, when it really was not Moses' law. Alright, so we'll continue. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, des describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Again, their idea of the law of Moses was completely different than what the true law of Moses was. Right. So later it says, now the apostles and elders came together to consider the matter. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us, and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. But we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul declaring how many miracles and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. And after they had to become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name, and with this the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. Known to God from eternity are, are all his works. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Right. So, now, I offer you my interpretation. Okay. There were people who kept the traditions of men contrary to the law of Moses 
saying, adding things to the law of Moses that were never part of the law of Moses and saying it's part of the law of Moses. And then they said uh, that a gen if a Gentile was not circumcised in their understanding of circumcision, which was com contrary to Torah, uh, uh, and, and if they kept all the commandments that they claimed that they had to keep, that meant they were not saved. But the righteous Christians, Nazarenes, noticing that those people were keeping traditions of men that were contrary to the law of Moses, uh, were requiring others to do so falsely. So the Nazarenes quickly called them out on this falsehood, and essentially the Nazarenes were saying that keeping and requiring others to keep the traditions of men that were contrary to the Torah is idolatry. And rather, the Gentiles are to refrain from idolatry. And saying such, they mention four idolatrous practices in order to summarize the entire scope of idolatry that the Gentiles were involved in. Sexual immorality in the context of idolatry. Blood uh, from things polluted by idols. And from strangling. So, I believe it's very clear that Paul is saying... If you keep the traditions of men that are contrary to the law of Moses, that's idolatry. But rather, the Gentiles are supposed to abstain from idolatry. And then he goes to list what idolatry is, what further things idolatry is. So he's clearly connecting the traditions of men contrary to the law of Moses and Scripture to idolatry. So that's all the Acts chapter 15 is about. It's about idolatry not about the Law of Moses, but it's about what people claim the Law of Moses is contrary to what it actually is. So I believe that is the true explanation and understanding of Acts chapter 15, the Council of Jerusalem. Uh, and I hope you appreciate my interpretation. And for a while I was very confused about this passage, but I believe I have found the true interpretation of it. So I hope this also blesses you and in your faith. Thank you and Shalom. Shalom, this is Anayahu. In this video I would like to uh, I would like to uh, talk about Ignatius of Antioch. He was a early Christian who uh, he was an early Christian who is falsely said to have been one of the most anti-Jewish people in uh, all of the church, uh, of the early church. Now, um, the truth is that he was not anti-Jewish, but he was against Judaism. Now, what is Judaism? Our, the Christian understanding of Judaism is completely false from what it originally meant back in the early church. According to Ignatius, the Old Testament prophets were not Jews. They were Christians. They, were not, they did not practice Judaism, but they practiced Christianity. All right? So, but the Old Testament prophets were obligated to keep the Law of Moses, but they were Christians? How does that make sense? Watch, I'll read it to you. I'll read from the letter of Ignatius, chapter 8. Alright, it says, Be not deceived by heretical opinions, nor by ancient fables, which are unprofitable. For if we live unto this present, according to the religion of the Jews, we acknowledge that we have not received grace. For the divine prophets lived according to Christ Jesus. On this account were they also persecuted, who by his grace were inspired to the end that the disobedient might be fully persuaded that there is one God who manifested himself through Jesus Christ, his Son, who is his eternal word, who came not forth from silence, who in all things as well pleasing to him that sent him. And I'll read another translation of uh, Ignatius, that passage from Ignatius, just to demonstrate how clear it is. It 
uh, one second while I find it. Um, all right, it says, uh, it says, um, do not be deceived by false opinions or old fables that are of no use, for if we lived according to Judaism until now, we admit that we have not received God's gracious gift, for the most divine prophets lived according to Jesus Christ. For this reason also they were persecuted. But they were inspired by his gracious gifts, so that the disobedient became fully convinced that there is one God who manifested himself through Jesus Christ, his Son, who is his word that came forth from silence, who is pleasing in every way to the one who sent him. So, it's very clear that Judaism, or the religion of the Jews, according to Ignatius, is something completely different than what Christians say it is. Judaism, or the religion of Jews, is not those that believe they have to keep the law of Moses. Rather, it's those that keep extra commandments that are contrary to the law of Moses. They keep traditions of men that are false, that are evil traditions of men that were never intended to be taught. We see this very clearly throughout scripture, how so many extra teachings from the Pharisees. Uh, in Mark chapter 7, Mark chapter 7, the Pharisees teach that everyone has to wash their hands. But this isn't fair in Torah at all. And another thing, the Pharisees tell that you couldn't heal on the Sabbath. Where is that found in the Torah? So you see, the Messiah and the Apostles were condemning the religion of the Jews, Judaism. But they were not condemning the true religion that embraces the law of Moses, Christianity. Christianity, I don't, you, I don't call myself a Christian because of what that term has come to mean today. It basically has come synonymous with anti anti-law of Moses, but that's not what the term originally meant. Christianity used to mean those that kept the law of Moses as it was intended to be kept. And so, we see that Judaism is a false religion, but that it's, Judaism is not what Christians claim it is, but rather Christianity is the true religion, but the true religion of Christianity requires that the law of Moses needs to be kept. Not that it's abolished. So anyone who teaches the law of Moses is abolished is not of the true faith. It's not of they're not Christian they're not from Christianity. They're not Christians. They're not true Christians. But as I said, since people have hijacked that term and made it mean antinomianism, now I refer to myself as a Nazarene because Nazarenes or Netzarim, those that was a term also used by the early church. The early Christians also called themselves Nazarenes, as we see from Acts chapter 24, I think it's 24 verse 5, where Paul is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect, where they call themselves Nazarenes. Um, but both the terms are, are accurate in the early church, Nazarenes and Christians. I refuse to call myself a Christian just because of what that means nowadays. But if it didn't mean that nowadays, then I would call myself a Christian because that's what we originally called ourselves, but we also call ourselves Nazarenes or Netzarim, so I call myself a Netzarim Yisraelite. Anyway, that's my video to prove that Judaism is not the true religion, but Judaism is not what you think it is, and Christianity is the true religion, true religion but Christianity is not what you think it is. Thank you, and Shalom. Shalom, this is Anayahu. In this video, I will be uh, looking at the book of First John, and I will be demonstrating that antinomianism is extremely false, and that we must stop sinning in order to be saved. Now, the most commonly used proof text by antinomians is verses eight through ten of chapter one of First John. But let, let's look at that. Out of context, it appears what they're teaching is true. It says, "If we say that we have no sin," We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Now, the antinomians will say that this means that we can't stop sinning, and anyone who claims they have stopped sinning is a liar, and we don't have to actually stop sinning in order to be saved, and we can't stop sinning. It's impossible.
and anyone who claims to have done so is a liar. That's completely ridiculous and completely contradicts the rest of the scriptures and especially contradicts this, the rest of the context of this book. All right. Now let's look at verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But if he cleansed us from unrighteousness, we would be we would have no sin if we were cleansed of unrighteousness. But the antinomians say, if we say we have no sin, or in other words, if we say that we've been cleansed of unrighteousness, we are liars. But verse 9 clearly contradicts that and says, if we, you know, it says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we're cleansed from all unrighteousness, that means that we don't have sin. So clearly your interpretation it leads to very contradictory results. And now let's, so now let's take a look at this. Now in, in Hebraic thought, there's this idea of parallelism. Now this concept is essentially you have, you have uh, two thoughts said subsequently and they're both said in different words, but they have the exact same meaning. They repeat it. They repeat the meaning in different words for emphasis. Look this up if you want proof. It's very clear. It's proven undeniably that Hebraic parallelism is a common thing employed by the biblical writers. So, this is a very likely possibility here. And frankly, it's the only thing that makes sense in the context of first john and the rest of scriptures it's the only thing that it's the only way to interpret this without leading to hopeless contradictions so let's go to verse now people like to quote verses 8 to 10 out of context but look at the prior three verses people we'll start reading from verse 5 for uh, this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that god is light and in him is no darkness at all if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. These three verses contradict completely the verses 8 to 10 in the interpretation of the antinomians. It says in verse 5, In him is no darkness at all. Now sin is darkness. If you're sinning, you're in darkness. Verse 6, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, he will cleanse us from all. It says he will cleanse us from all sin. So again, it, it's very clear. Now, let's go to verse wait, Verse 6 says, if we say that we have fellowship with him. So it's talking about a specific we here. The we is the one, the we that's being discussed is the one that says, we have fellowship with him, but what they actually, but they don't because they walk in darkness. Verse 7 says, but if we walk in the light, now who's the we? The we is the one, the we from verse 6. It's the we that says they have fellowship with him, but walk in darkness. So if those that say they have fellowship with him, but walk in darkness, walk in the light as he is in the light, then they will have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ's son will cleanse them from all their sin. Now verse 8, if we say, now who's the we? It's the we that says they have no fellowship, but I mean that they have fellowship, but they walk in darkness. So in other words, so it says if we say that we have no sin, or in other words, if we say that we have fellowship with him, but walk in darkness, that's the clear context here. The parallelism requires it. If we say that we have no sin, but walk in in darkness we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us if we who walk in darkness confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness again here's the we in verse 10 if we who are sinning and who have sinned say that we have not sinned we make him a liar and his words not in us it's very clear that this is what the intended meaning is not what the antinomians teach now, is there more evidence for this? Of course. Let's look at the rest of the 
Let's look at the entire book of 1 John. Starting in 1 John uh, chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father of Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. People, it's so very clear. It says, he's, why is he writing this? So that we may not sin. Why would he be writing something if it's impossible to happen? And then it says, and if, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. If, not when. It's not when someone sins. It's if. So it indicates the possibility of not sinning. And then it says, if we have an advocate, uh, if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. What that means is, not that if we sin, it's okay because we're covered. No, that's not what it means at all. Don't try to justify your sin, people. That's a license to immorality, as Jude, in his letter, his epistle, condemns very explicitly. Now, what it's saying is, if we sin, there is an advocate with the Father who is able to advocate for us if we stop sinning, if we walk in righteousness, if we walk in the light. Then, he's there for us. He's the advocate for us if we choose to accept him. But we can only accept him by stop sinning. That's the idea here, people. Now, let's continue. Verse 3 of First John chapter 2. Know by this, we know, now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who abides, he who says he abides in him, ought himself also to walk just as he walked. So let's continue. Let's go to verse 9 of 1 John chapter 2. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness, and does not know where he is going, because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now let's go to verse 15 of chapter 2. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world... The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Now, let's... Uh, little children, it is the last hour. And uh, as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest, that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One. And you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Alright, now let's continue. Alright, we'll go to uh, verses tw verse 28 of uh, chapter 2. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Now let's go to verse 4, verse four of chapter 3 of First John. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For the purpose of the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin, because he has been born of God. And in, in this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. 
Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life, because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Let's continue down further. Uh, we'll go down to... Uh, let's skip a little bit. And we'll go... I'm skipping a little bit. Uh... Okay, verse 20 of First John uh, chapter 4. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have also from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. First John chapter 5. We'll, we'll go down to... Uh, Alright, we'll go down to verse 14. Okay. To the end. Uh, no, we'll start with uh, we'll start with verse 18 to the end. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know Him who is true, and we are in Him who is true, in His Son Jesus Christ. This is a true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. It's very clear from reading 1 John in context. There's no way to interpret it any other way. With an open mind and fair analysis. And without, you know, if, you, if you're unbiased, if you're biased, then of course you're going to try to justify these things and make up your own interpretations that are very contradictory and contrary to the clear meaning. But it's very clear from 1 John. The whole book, it's very clear that you must stop sinning to be saved. If you're not, if you're sinning, you're of the devil. Anyone of God does not sin. First John says that in chapter 3 and chapter 5. It's very, very, very clear. So stop sinning, people. Stop believing in antinomianism. Repent. Cease from all sin so that you may be saved. Because only those who stop sinning are going to be saved. And there's nothing in the scriptures that say you can't stop sinning. That's only your warped view that you created to justify your sin. So, scripture says, stop sinning and you will be saved. If you don't stop sinning, you're of the devil and you will perish. So please, people, please. Repent and stop being antinomianism. Stop teaching antinomianism to people. Stop trying to justify your sins. First John condemns you who sin. If you claim to be a Christian and you sin, you are a liar and you are evil and you need to repent and stop sinning in order to be saved. I am ashamed of anyone that calls himself a Christian and yet sins. There you have it. That's my video on 1 John and needing to stop sinning in order to be saved. Uh, thank you for watching and Shalom. Shalom, this is Anayahu. In this video, I would like to discuss why I believe the Law of Moses is not abolished uh, and why I believe the common Christian interpretation that the food laws were abolished is ridiculous. It's contrary to scripture and uh, I'm going to explain why I believe that we're supposed to keep the, the food laws still, all right? So, first we have to discuss uh, why the law of, of Moses was given in the first place, or for specifically, why were the food laws given in the first place? Now, many people say the food laws were only given to Israel, but is that true? We look before, we look before the law of Moses and we see with Noah, Noah was told to gather unclean animals, a certain, a certain amount of unclean animals, and, a cer and even more amounts of clean animals. Now, how did Noah know the distinction between clean and unclean animals in back in Genesis? How did he know that? 
he had to have been revealed that before the law of Moses, what the, the laws between clean and unclean were. So it's clear that these laws for unclean and clean meats goes before the law of Moses. All right. So it's not anything about the law of Moses. So that's the first thing. There's many other examples of this uh, where it's not about the law of Moses. It's about righteousness. For example, Abraham. Abraham was a Gentile, but he was told, he was commanded, obligated to circumcise himself and his household. Circumcision people. That's like the, one of the most, the things that people say is the most Israelite thing possible. But it's pre-Mosaic, people. It's pre-Moses. It's Abraham, not Moses, that first started circumcision as a requirement. We also have the laws uh, not to eat blood. That that goes way before Noah, but Noah Noah was given the commandment again. He was re-given it. Now, at any rate, let us look in Isaiah chapter 66, verse 17. Those who sanctify themselves and purify themselves to go to the gardens after an idol in the midst, eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together, says the Lord. In this chapter, or in, in these two chapters, chapters 65 to 66 of Isaiah, it's a millennial context. It's in the institution of the millennial kingdom. But that's after the sacrifice of the Messiah. That's after Jesus, Yehushua, the Messiah, died on the cross. So how can scripture be saying that people who eat unclean animals like swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse will be destroyed for doing that at the institutional millennial kingdom? If the law if the laws of food were abolished, then how could he how could it say that? But it clearly says those who eat the unclean animals will be consumed together. They will be destroyed because they eat unclean animals after Messiah's death. So you have to try to understand how you you as a Christian you, you're going to see that that kind of contradicts your view, your belief that the laws of food being done abolished. Now let's think. Let's ask a question as to why were the why were the laws of food implanted in the first place? It's very clearly about health. All right. The only reason we were told not to eat unclean animals. It's because it's unhealthy to eat unclean animals. Just look at the animals that we're dealing with here. Swines, uh, shrimp, uh, all these different things. Do you, you know what they eat? Swines will eat waste products, anything they find. They are cleaners of the environment and that they'll eat all the bad stuff. The same thing with the bottom dwellers. All bottom dwellers are unclean. The bottom dwellers are at the bottom of the ocean. They're, they eat unclean... They eat gross things. They eat waste products. Their bodies were made for that. It's not unhealthy for them to do that because that's what they were made to do it for. Their bodies were made to take in toxic stuff and for them not to get sick by it. But our bodies were not made to do that. So when we eat those things, it makes us unhealthy. So that's why we're not supposed to eat unclean animals, because it's unhealthy for us. It's very clear logic, and if you just look at the science of it, you look at the science, it's very clear. We're not supposed to eat these things. It's not healthy for us. It's not good. Paul says in his writings that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. Now, we are not to defile the temple. That's what Paul says, do not defile the temple. But when you damage it, when you just, when you put disgusting stuff into your body, that's defiling it. So when you eat unclean animals, when you eat unhealthy, you're you are defiling your the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that grieves the Holy Spirit when you do that. So that's a reason right there. You don't do that. The the same reason we don't drink uh well, we, it's okay to drink, it's do not to become drunk. And the same reason that we don't do drugs, because it's unhealthy and it defiles our body. Alright? So that's why we don't eat unclean... That's why we were given the, the laws to not eat unclean animals. 
That's why we're not supposed to eat fruit from an uncircumcised tree. That's why we're not supposed to eat blood. It's all about health, right? To deny this simple fact of science is to willfully be ignorant of the truth and to justify eating unhealthy and justify defiling your the, te the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that's a grave sin to do that. So now let us continue with some commonly discussed passages in the New Testament that are used to teach that the law, the food laws are not to be kept. Uh, Mark chapter 7 is a common one. Now pe what people don't realize is that uh, they were, Orthodox Judaism is not a modern thing. It's a very ancient, ancient thing. And what they teach is something called the Oral Torah. The concept of Oral Torah is that they get to add things and their word is more superior than the Torah. So if the Oral Torah says something that contradicts the scriptures, the Oral Torah is the one that they're to follow, not the scriptures. So there's this idea of traditions of men, the traditions of men versus the traditions of God. And it, it violates it. It's contradictory to the intent, the commandments of God. This is what is being condemned in the New Testament scriptures, not the law of Moses. Let's look at Mark chapter 7. Look at here. It says, they're criticizing the disciples for wa eating bread with unwashed hands. It says in verse 5, Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? So they're condemning, they're saying, Why are your disciples not eating with unwashed hands? Now, the Torah, the scriptures never say, You are not to eat bread with unwashed hands. It says priests, Levites, are not supposed to eat with unwashed hands, but not the, the common people. So the Pharisees are adding this. It's never meant to be intended. Never. But they're obligating it for everyone to keep. That's not righteous to do that. Now we'll continue. Verse 8. Messiah is condemning those people, the Pharisees that are condemning his disciples for not eating with washed hands. He says, They lay aside the commandment of God and hold the tradition of men. And this is verse 8. The washing of pitchers and cups, and many other such things you do. So the tradition of men is contrary to the commandment of God, the washing of pitchers and cups, and many other such things you do. I'll go to the very next verse, verse 9, uh, verse 10. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses his father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from him, from me is Corban, that is a gift to God, and you no longer let him do anything for his father or his mother, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition which you have handed down, and many such things you do. So he's clearly saying that the law of Moses is the word of God. Because the word, law of Moses, he, that's what he says, For Moses said, Honor your father and mother. He who curses his father and mother, let me put to death. That's the law of Moses, and he's calling that the word of God. But he's saying the traditions of men... Uh, Make the word of God, the law of Moses, tell of no effect through their traditions of men which have been handed down. So this is what's clearly the context of the scriptures, not what Christians claim it to be. Now, let's continue. Let's continue with this same passage, all right? All right, we look. Later on, it says in... Verse 14, when he had said, when he had called all the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear me, everyone, and understand. There is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. When he had, uh, and then a little bit later, uh, verse 18, so he had said to them, Are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him, because it does not enter his heart but his stomach, and is illuminated, thus purifying all foods? And he said, What comes out of a man defile that defiles a man? For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, 
lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. This is not saying what people think it's saying. It's clearly saying that sin is not something physical. It's from within. So, for instance, drink, being dr a drunkard. The, the amount of wine in your body, the amount of wine that enters into your body, is not what is sinful. It's the inner part of, it's your heart that is doing the drinking that makes you evil. It's coming from your heart, not the, not the alcohol itself. It's your heart, all right? As well as the, when you eat unclean food. It's your heart that makes you evil when you eat the unclean food, not the unclean food in and of itself. It's the desires of your heart. It's your heart that makes you evil not the physical things you're doing. If it was the physical things you were doing, then you would be evil for having relations with your wife because there's nothing different from, there's nothing different physically with, fr physically different with compared to having relations with your wife and committing adultery. The same physical thing is happening. The only difference is what's from coming from your heart. That's what makes it a sin. That's what Mark chapter 7 was talking about. Now, I don't have too much time, so I'll try to go through this quickly. Acts chapter 10 is talking, uh, people use that to say Peter's vision. Uh, Peter's vision abolishes the food laws, but this is not true. Let's go down to verse 14. No, verse 13 of chapter 10. And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Verse 14. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. Uh, and verse 15, and a voice spoke to him again the second time, what God has cleansed you must not call common. Verse 16, this was done three times and the object was taken up into heaven again. Now look at the very next verse, verse 17. Now while Peter wondered within himself what the vision which he had seen meant, behold, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so it clearly says that Peter has no idea what the dream means. Wait. What is this dream saying? It obviously can't mean the literal thing that it's saying. Okay, it's not talking about not, that we don't have we don't call unclean animals clean. It's not talking about that. Otherwise, Peter would have understood what the dream was about. But he has no idea what it's about. Then we go into the next chapter, and finally he realizes that he says, uh, "Where where is it?" Um, So, he, I, I, I can't find it, um, but it's in the very, I think it's in the next chapter, and basically he realizes that it's not the unclean animals that it's talking about. He's saying, do not call Gentiles unclean when I have made them clean. Alright? So it's not talking about unclean animals, it's talking about Gentiles. So, the meaning of the vision is not about food. It's about people. It's not about food, it's about people. Alright? That's the interpretation of Acts, chapter 10 to 11. Now, there's other verses in Scripture that Christians will probably use, cite, but I didn't have enough time. This is only a 15 minute video, so for now, this is all I can do. Uh, the other ones I'm sure people will bring up will be other letter, letters of Paul, such as Romans chapter 14 and uh, Acts chapter 15, and things like that. I could address those in another video or in comments or something, but anyways, thank you for watching this video, and shalom.